I should ask Kim, should I? How <laughs> I many of you know how that is? You gotta ask your spouse if you're gonna be all right before the Lord. I'll tell you what, they'll let you know, won't they? <laughs> hey, I tell you, we're gonna do something real different tonight, real strange, real odd, okay? We're actually gonna open up the Bible tonight. <laughs> wow. I was not prepared for this. Does that ever happen around here where we open up the Word of God? <laughs> We're going to see some examples tonight also through the Savior. I told Brother John before the service, and I think we ought to follow this example. Uh, I'm going to just take five minutes. We're going to take up the offering, okay, uh, right off the bat. We're going to go ahead and just sing a hymn, maybe two. And Jimmy, we're going to be quiet as well, right? 
Okay, Mikey, we're going to be quiet, all right? Mikey, Mikey, we're going to be quiet, right? Can we do, can we be quiet? No more talking? Good, man, that's awesome. You know what I do? I just go like this. <laughs> Good, Mikey. You don't have to lay down. But anyway, let's pray. All right, and ask the Lord to give us a blessing. Father, I thank you for old and young. I thank you, Father, for the joy of having the next generation in our church. I praise you for Alicia, for the guidance and the leadership that she and Emmanuel and others have given to our children's group. Father, I thank of those that have worked tirelessly on Wednesdays as well. All of those teams, dear Lord God, that work with our kids. And I'm grateful that you've allowed them to to make, decide, to make the decision to be in here with us tonight. I think it's good for them. I think these people that are leading our children's group are just wise. And I just pray, dear Lord God, you'd give them strength throughout the evening. And help us, dear Lord God, to understand what you're doing. Lord, I ask you for a, a good crowd. And you brought them. It's just phenomenal. I glorify you because in prayer, we see you moving. Now, Lord, there may be somebody sitting at home right now thinking, what am I doing? I need to be in church. That God, prick their hearts and bring them even now. Draw them to yourself tonight. And as the ushers come, we get ready to take up this offering tonight. I pray, Father, that you'll bless, even as you did this morning in the offering time. Give us wisdom, dear Lord God, as we take up our tithes and offerings. Because certainly, there's nothing better than to come to the house of God prepared to sacrifice. And so, Lord God, we come to you desiring to lift your name through obedience first and foremost. And then, dear Lord God, on top of that, heaping the blessing and sacrifice. I pray, Father, that it would be seen as something beautiful in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, instead of doing an offertory during this time, why don't you grab your hymn book and go to hymn 683, and we'll sing, I Need Thee Every Hour, as Brother Gary comes. 638, just like I said, him <laughs> six. What? Oh, Amen. six. <laughs> stand together, dear Lord, as we sing. Let's all stand. 638. And 1032. Very good. Amen. 638. We're going to sing the first and the last stanza. I need every hour for praise of the Lord. show us different kinds of things with reference to this. Now, would you rather have the handheld or this thing? You'd like this, wouldn't you? Okay. All right. Let me put it on you here. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, 
Well, the pastor asked us to come to do the Passover Seder, and so uh, when I do the Passover Seder, I use a model called the Passover Speaks, because the Passover does speak about a lot of things scripturally, but it primarily speaks of Jesus Christ and his coming sacrifice for our sin. Amen. 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 Right. And uh, that <clears throat> is really the crux and heart of what the Passover is all about. So I like to give a little preliminary information about the Passover. When the Jewish people celebrate the Passover, you will see during this that uh, we'll go to the text in a minute, which is found, by the way, if you want to get out of your Bibles, in Exodus chapter 12, primarily, there are other passages, but uh, Exodus 12, and uh, when the Jewish people do the Passover in their homes now, uh, it looks quite different than the biblical Passover that we'll see in Exodus chapter 12, because there's a lot of extra things on this table, which you probably can see, that were not in the original Passover, and we'll talk about that. But uh, the Jewish people celebrate the Passover differently in uh, many of their different traditions. They have different foods and different things they do, but they follow the same uh, kind of theme. Now, the Passover uh, uh, is also found in Deuteronomy 16, if you want to you know, mark that in your Bible. And then there's a New Testament reference that we'll talk about later at the very end in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 to 8. And that's where we find the clear connection to the Lord Jesus Christ that's made by the New Testament. <clears throat> now, the guard for the Passover, of course, the Passover is done by the father of the home, or it could be a grandfather, depending on sometimes extended family. Everyone would be around the table. Uh, and uh, now there is a meal that goes to the Passover. But we're not going to have the meal tonight, unless the ladies want to get busy in the kitchen pretty quick. <laughs> so... But uh, I have done the Passover with a full meal, and that's quite a, quite a real goal to do that. But, but, but it's a blessing, but, uh, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the guard, usually the, the man who's doing the Passover, the father, he would wear a garment like this. Now the problem with this garment is my wife made it, but the problem, it's called a kittle. But my wife made it, but it doesn't fit me. So if I put that on, I'm not going to be able to do the Passover. I won't be able to move. So, so what I do instead is I wear a yarmulke. And Jewish men cover their heads when they're in a religious kind of setting. And they sometimes, uh, they often wear a prayer shawl. Maybe you've seen the prayer shawls at the Wailing Wall, things like that. So I put this on. But really, they would be wearing stuff. Uh, on the floor. <laughs> really, they would be wearing this thing. And the Jewish man uses that all throughout his life. It's usually made sometime in his early part of his life for when he gets married. Wow. He'll wear that all the way through his life, and then he'll often be buried in that, the more religious Jews. And many Jews today are not religious anymore. It's a lot of secular Jews. We see a lot of those in our ministry. Um, now, with the prayer shawl, of course, they have lots of knots in the prayer shawl which represent all the laws of Moses. You see all these knots tied up, 613 of those, that they try to, to keep, which, of course, who that's quite a job, you know. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, so that's uh, what uh, the father would do when he's getting ready for the Passover. Now, the Passover points to the sacrifice of Jesus, right, yes. to Calvary. Uh, we have to remember when Jesus was before Pilate, it was during the Passover season, when he was uh, arrested, and he's going through the passion that led to the cross. You know what the Jewish people in Jerusalem were doing? They were sacrificing all of these lambs, thousands of lambs. And there, uh, right in the heart of it all, at that moment in history, was the Lord Jesus Christ who was be going to come the ultimate Passover wow. lamb. The lamb of God, what does John say? The lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't take away sin. They could cover it for a time, and they had to do it again and again. Uh, but Jesus 
took it away. Once you're saved by the blood of Christ, your sin is gone. Past, Amen. present, future. Yes. Gone. So now it also represents some other things. It represents deliverance from slavery, for right. instance. There's that imagery of slavery in Egypt. Uh, it prefigures, of course, deliverance from sin, right? Uh, and it, 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 it represents the redemption from Egypt. The Jewish people uh, were liberated. So it's like a Jewish holiday, if you will, that celebrates their freedom. So they have the freedom now to worship God. That's what they, that's what they wanted to do when they left Egypt. And it also became a memorial of suffering, right? A memorial of their suffering, but also a memorial of, uh, in, in the Lord's Supper later on of the suffering of Christ. Now, the Passover, contrary to popular opinion, you know, when you look on a calendar, the Passover is going to be a, a week long, they're going to say, you know. And, and it is true, it is a period of a week, but the Passover itself is only one day. It's just one day. Uh, there, because there are three feasts that run together there. Uh, there's the Passover, one day, and then right on top of it, for seven days, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you want to look at the feast, we don't have time to do that tonight, I wish we did, but if you want to look at the feast, where do we go to look at the feasts? Uh, it, of the Old Testament feasts, the seven biblical feasts I'm talking about. There are other minor feasts, but those those are not the ones that God ordained particularly. But these seven feasts are found in Leviticus 23, and you'll see them there. If you want to read that this week, I'll give you some good Bible reading for this week. That would be one passage. Yes, and so the Passover, unleavened bread, and then a couple of days into the Passover, unleavened bread, we come to first fruits. Now, all of these represent, are, are related to the first coming of Christ, right? Yeah. Along with the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. Also related, we just had that, by the way, Shav Shavuot. That's right. Called in, in Hebrew. Shavuot is the feast 50 days when the Holy, you know, in the New Testament, that's when the Holy Spirit came. And on that feast. Right. So the, those were all related to the first coming of Christ. Now there are three other feasts. The Feast of <laughs> Trumpets, which is called Rosh Hashanah now. Uh, the Jewish New Year. It's really, the Passover was a new year in the Bible. But that's not true anymore. The civil New Year now in Israel is Rosh Hashanah. And that's in September or October around there. So Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, Yom Kippur would be the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, those are related to the second coming of Christ. They're the fall feast. It's a perfect image. The spring feast, the first coming of Christ. Then there's an interlude, the summer interlude. And then in the fall feast, we have the feast that relates to the second coming of Christ. Now, the Haggadah, I'll show you the Haggadah. Now again, the Haggadah is a very interesting book. This one is in Hebrew and English. Uh, you can look at it. I have a Christian one, too. This one is Jewish, actually. Uh, but the family Haggadah is what the father will use to, uh, for his uh, ceremony, the service of the Seder, the service of the Passover. We, we can't do all this tonight, or we'll be here till 9 o'clock or 10. Maybe. So there are a lot of prayers. There are a lot of different Hebrew prayers that the Father will go through and so forth and so on at every step of the way. So we are not going to be able to do those, but I'll tell you when those things will occur and you'll see how it flows, okay? So the Haggadah is the story of Passover and how it goes. So, uh, and in the, in the Haggadah, by the way, they're going to tell the whole story of what the Passover means uh, during that uh, particular uh, service. Now, what do they do? Children are taught ahead of time about the Passover, what it means. And, but I want you to notice one thing. We're going to talk about a lot about Christ in the Passover. That's why we're doing this tonight. We want to see Christ in the Passover because he is all over the Passover. But think of this. The Jewish people don't see any Christ in the Passover. They have, they're completely blind. So one of the things you can pray for when you're thinking of the Passover, you think Jewish people do this every single year and they miss Christ. That's right. And but, but we pray for them a lot of times. 
we send Jewish people cards, contact me up at the Passover, and we, we want to kind of remind them that the Passover has a deeper, another meaning. And, uh, and we pray that the Jewish people, that some of them might see Christ. They read all the scriptures, even. This is amazing in the Old Testament. Like Psalm 118, we'll, we'll read a few verses later on. But the Passover Psalms, for instance, Christ is all over those Psalms in the Old Testament. They're called the Halal Psalms. We'll talk about that. But then, uh, of course, what do they do? When they're getting ready for the Passover, the Jewish people, they'll take a collection for the poor, for one thing. A lot of Jewish people are poor, believe it or not, contrary to popular opinion. Not all Jewish people are rich, and it comes from the idea of the shared Passover lamb. And that's where I'd like to start, stop a minute before we go any further, and read the passage, just a bit of it, in Exodus chapter 12. Now, the whole of Exodus chapter 12 is 50-some verses. It all relates to the Passover, but we won't read all of it. But we will read verse 1 to verse 13. And that will give you the main gist. And then I'll refer to some other verses later on in the text, if you will. But uh, let's look at this and ask the Lord to bless his word. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. So they're still in Egypt, right? And they're, and they're in captivity. And, and the Lord said, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So this is at the beginning of the year, back in the Bible. Okay? Not anymore, but it, it was then. Uh, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. There's the lamb. According to the house of their father, fathers, pardon me, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, what could they do? They could share it with another family. Isn't that, yeah, that's an, that's mm -hmm. the Passover is to be shared. It's a message yeah, of sharing. You want to share the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your, your lamb. I like that. Now look at that verse, verse 5. Your lamb. Amen. It's personal. The lamb has to be yours. Amen. Jesus has to be yours if you're going to be saved. Yeah, good. Right? Uh, know a lot about Jesus, but if you don't know Jesus, right. there's a big difference. Right? Yeah. Uh, right. Your lamb shall be without blemish. No blemishes on this lamb. Foreshadows the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Sinless. No right. sin. Right? A male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat. Some people don't realize it. Put it in a sheep or a goat. Put it in a kid. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. They had to examine it for a while. Make sure it was without blemish. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. They all did it at the same time. But then look what else they had to do. It says, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. They had to put the blood on the door post of their house. And they had to make a personal application of the blood to their own house. Just like we have to have a personal uh, experience with the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Wow. Uh, so deliverance is personal. That's right. They may have killed the lamb, but if they didn't put the blood on the doorpost, it wouldn't have done them any good. That's right. So, uh, so then it says that they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, so they're supposed to eat it, and unleavened bread. No leaven in the bread. Leaven in the Bible is often a picture of sin. Right. So we don't want any leaven in the bread. And with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So there are only a few elements in this Passover, not very many. And then it says, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, and his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. So this sacrifice was consumed. And, uh, and it says, and thus shall ye eat it, 
with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat in haste. They were in a hurry, right? right. God was going to take them out. Uh, it is the Lord's Passover. Notice it's the Lord's Passover. Right. And uh, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. What was going to happen? <coughs> no blood on the doors. Death. Right. Judgment. Right? And uh, so I will pass through the land of Egypt. We'll smite all the firstborn, excuse me, in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, all those plagues. They weren't just against the Egyptians, they were against the gods of Egypt. Right. They show the powerlessness of the gods of Egypt compared to the Almighty God. Yeah. Uh, I will execute judgment, I am the Lord. And then here's the verse we want. This is the key verse. And it says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, Amen. Amen. The song, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No judgment on that house. So the angel, the death angel, would see the blood. Ah, blood on that house. Go right on to the next one. Ah, no judgment, no death. Right. To that house that had the blood applied. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So we'll stop there. But there you have uh, the crux of the Passover, what God told them to do and what effect it would have. Uh, it, was a, it was a means of salvation, of avoiding that death judgment on the firstborn. And so when Jewish people celebrate, they really celebrate the Passover as a great festival, a lot of joy. There was a reason to be joyful that they were being delivered. And they were delivered from the plague. And they were going to be out of Egypt and so forth and so on. So uh, what do they do? Well, they buy Passover clothes. They buy kosher food, a lot of food, uh, the Orthodox especially. They do Passover cleaning. You know that's in the book. It's in the book of Exodus. Wow. Right? Yeah. Exodus verse 15. Look at verse 15. I'm not going to read it. Yeah. But uh, they had to clean the house for... I believe it's a week before it says in there, seven days before. They had to get all the leaven out. And that's what Jewish people do. A lot of Jewish people, if they live, sometimes they'll give the leaven stuff in their house to their Gentile neighbors. Here you can have it. <laughs> we have to get rid of it. Uh, and so that's what they do. And then they put down, they go through a ceremony on the night of Passover. And they go through a ceremony, and what they'll do is that. The ladies of the house, they've done all the cleaning, got all the leaven, the, the leaven out, and then they take a feather like that. And they go through, and they get, and they have a few crumbs of leaven, usually symbolic. And they get that leaven up in a little pile, and they gather it up, and they meticulously get it on, pick it up on the spoon, and they put it in an envelope like this. I'm not saying it's so good, but they seal the envelope. The lady of the house will give it to her husband. He'll take it outside. He'll be in the house. And he'll burn it. Yeah. And that's the last bit of leaven that's in the house. So now the house is ready for the Passover. And so uh, they, then the father and the sons, the men, they go off to the synagogue. And they'll have a service at the synagogue. And what do you think the ladies of the house are doing? They stay home that night. They're preparing the Passover table just like this, only they'll, as I said, they'll have a big meal and uh, lots of good food. And then the father returns home and the Seder meal and the Passover will begin because it's first of all a family affair. Oh, yes. Because it was, held, remember, it was held in the house in Egypt. Right. It wasn't held at the synagogue back in Moses' day or anything like that. Now, remember, the original Passover was only three things, really. Well, not including uh, grape juice, which uh, would be the wine, but three, three elements. The lamb, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs. Those are the only things mentioned in the scripture. So that would have been a, a pretty stark meal, if you know what I mean. Uh, wouldn't have been the big, lavish meal they do today now. But uh, 
But then we, but now we have a whole bunch more Passover symbols. So I want to tell you about those first of all, um, and then we'll start to go through the ceremony itself. First of all, we have the, the matzah. The matzah is the unleavened bread. This is what they use today, of course. And the matzah represents what the the body of Christ, and it's right sinless. in our view, sinless body of Christ, no leaven. Uh, if you look, hold this up to the light, and see my, it's a little hard, they didn't do it too well. Uh, but, uh, but it's a Jewish matzah, by the way. Uh, but uh, these matzah breads are straight and pierced. Oh, yeah. Amazing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And these are made by Jewish people. With these stripes. Oh, wow. Sometimes we think, well, how did that happen? Well, I'll tell you, I'll just give you a little uh, advanced clue. And we think a lot of other things came into the Passover during the days of the early church because the Passover and Easter were celebrated together, Resurrection Sunday, uh, by the early Messianic Jews, Christian Jewish believers. Uh, they weren't separated like this is Jew Jewish Passover and this is because most of the early church were what? They were all Jewish for a number of years. Uh, so. We think some things came in at that time. We're not sure. There's no way to, to know for certain. But that mass is striped and pierced. And what they do in the Seder is they have this in a threefold bag. This is called a matzah tashin. And it holds the ceremonial matzah. This here is the matzah they eat during the meal with the food. But this is the ceremonial matzah that the, past, that the father will use and it has three compartments in there. One, two, three. Yeah. And uh, so they'll say, well, that represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you know, when you look at it and you see what I'm gonna do with it in a little while, you know, I think you'll probably say that represents Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. And you know which one they're gonna take out to do the ceremony? It'll be the middle one, yeah. the Son. And so uh, we'll see that in a minute. But there's a lot of other ideas. Some of the Jewish people believe it represents God and the high priest and the people. So there are different views among the Jewish people themselves. The rabbis write about all those things all the time. They have a lot of opinions. Dr. Gartenhouse used to say, if you have five rabbis, you'll have at least six opinions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyway. Uh, the roasted shank bone of the lamb we have on here, we don't use the lamb anymore in the Passover. There is no lamb. Why not? Because he's in heaven. Too. Well, he's in heaven, but the Jewish people don't care about that, yeah. unfortunately. But the reason they use the bone is because their reason is there's no temple. So they cannot do, right. there's no way to do the Passover right. and the sacrifices right. as it has to be done according to the scriptures in the Old Testament. So as a mourning symbol of the temple, you can't do the Passover the way it should be done. They have just a shank bone of the lamb. By the way, they don't eat lamb for the Passover either, usually. They eat, well, often they eat brisket or they eat chicken. Uh, those are two things I've seen. Uh, but they don't eat lamb for the Passover anymore. And that's because there's no temple, there's no, no lamb that can be sacrificed with nothing to be, none of the Old Testament sacrifices and all the rest of it, Jewish worship can be done without the temple. So, uh, and then they have the bitter herbs. We use horseradish for the bitter herbs. Now, that's hot. If you come up and taste this after, which I'll let you do, be careful of that one. You know, you don't be careful. They eat it on the matzah, when we'll get to that. But, uh, so, the bitter herbs, maro, remember? Uh, reminder of the bitterness of slavery. Slavery was a bitter experience for the Jewish people and for their ancestors in Egypt. You see that in verse 8 there in Exodus chapter 12. The roasted egg, the roasted, it's a roasted hard boiled egg. Now that's an odd one. Where did it come from? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> Nobody knows. But it's been in the Passover for hundreds of years already. But with this, the Jewish people have different versions of what that means. It's called the baitza, baitza. 
And the Weitzer, lots of ideas, they say it represents life. New life. New life in an egg. And so it represents the fact that they escaped death, some of them said, in Egypt. Uh, and uh, perhaps symbolizes the offering that they brought to the temple festival, some say. But, uh, but it has a lot of different thoughts about what it means. But it certainly was not in the original Passover. So uh, let's remember that. Now the Haraset is something here that Marilyn was doing over there. Remember she was crash, crashing things with a hammer. And something. This is uh, it's representative of the mortar that they used to make the bricks wow. in Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, this is the tastiest thing on the table. And it represents the crushing that brings sweetness out of trouble, sweetness out of a bitter experience. Did you ever have that come through a bad experience, but somehow the Lord uses it for a glorious kind of renewal for yeah. someone? Yeah. And that's what that means. It's a reminder. It represents sweetness that comes from suffering. Uh, the, car the carpus or the, the, the parsley here represents new life. Uh, it's the very first thing that they'll take uh, when they start the Passover, uh, actually, and they dip it in this little bowl here. Come up and taste this water here. Salt water, which represents the tears that were shed as slaves in Egypt. And so uh, the tears of the suffering of the people, if you will. Then, of course, we have the wine. We have the grape juice, symbol of joy, symbol of thanksgiving. Four cups. There'll be four cups during the Passover as we get to doing it. Uh, and they uh, go back to a different part of Exodus. I will tell you what it is. We don't really have time to read all that. But it's in Exodus chapter 6. And it relates in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. If you want to read that this week, that would be a good thing to do. Exodus 6, there's a section in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, where the, are the four I wills. I am the Lord and I will. Yeah. And it goes on. So that's the passage. And that's what the four cups are looking to. There's a cup of sanctification. Cups sometimes have different names uh, by different uh, rabbis have called them by different names. But the cup of sanctification is usually the first one. That's the one where they representatively will dip the celery, which represents what? Hyssop, remember? Yeah, the hyssop. But, and they dip it in that in the first cup. And that's what they used to put. And I'm not going to do that. We'll have grape juice all over the place. Right? <laughs> so we don't want to do that But uh, right now. But uh, the first cup, cup of sanctification. The second cup is called the cup of deliverance. Uh, and, or sometimes it's called the cup of blessing. Because they were delivered. Uh, and with the second cup, there's a time of question. And we'll go through that. And the children usually ask the questions. Uh, and there's a prayer uh, in every generation our enemies rise up to destroy us the father will say but thou O Lord hast delivered us Amen. that's what they'll say cup, the third cup is the cup of redemption that's a cup that will particularly interest us it's probably probably because there were four cups uh, Sometimes it's called the cup of redemption or judgment. It's the cup that probably the Lord used, the third cup, to institute the Lord's Supper. We'll see that in, in Luke chapter 22. And then the fourth cup is the cup of praise or the cup of communion, sometimes called the cup of the coming kingdom. And then this large cup down here is called the cup of Elijah. That's the place for Elijah. Elijah is always the unseen guest at every Seder. That place will stay there empty throughout the meal. And we'll uh, have a time with Elijah at the end of the Seder. He's the invisible guest 
at every Seder. There's a cushion on the Father's chair because the Passover meal is done very leisurely. We don't have to rush like we had to do the Passover in Egypt. So, uh, and they take a comfortable time. Sometimes the Passover will last four or five hours. <coughs> they go through all the courses and everything. So, we won't stay that long tonight, actually. <laughs> so, uh, we have got us, already mentioned that. And then the Seder means the order of service for the Passover. But it has also come to mean the meal that we're not going to have tonight. Because the ladies didn't get to cook me. That's what I'm forced to do that tonight. So, let's begin with what we do. First comes the first cup, the cup of sanctification. And the Father will pour this cup. They do it differently. Sometimes everyone has their own cup, and he will fill everyone's cup. Sometimes they have just one cup, and they will pass it around, and, and uh, they will drink that, uh, of that cup. They all drink of the first cup, and this will be the cup where we take our hyssop and symbolically dip that in as a remembrance of putting the blood on the doorpost of our houses. Then the other thing that is done, and they would drink of it, of course, and they'll drink it all. Sometimes they don't put a whole lot in there. But then uh, the Father and everyone else, they'll have bowls, they'll wash their hands because they're very concerned with being clean and pure for the Passover ceremony. And they have a clean linen towel, and they'll dry their hands. Now, I am not going to do that every time I do something tonight, or those, that's the kind of thing that'll make us be here all night. So, but they would do that a dozen or two dozen times during the Passover meal after every step. So. Um, that is how that would go. And then the greens are eaten as a sort of an appetizer. This is when they would take the parsley. They would also, might also eat the celery, dip it in that, those tears, and enjoy that, thinking about new life. Parsley also represents new life, the green of spring. Now when spring comes out there, what happens? Greens start to pop out everywhere and we see new life all around after the very dead winter. And that's what the Jewish people experienced coming out of Egypt, right? New, fresh life. They were no longer slaves, and uh, they were free. Uh, so the matzah, the matzah speaks so very clearly of the Messiah, of the coming Messiah, the coming Passover lamb, who would be Jesus, and of course many there will be many other prophecies coming along uh, about the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's the sinless substitute. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 5 tells us that, for instance. The mat this matzotash, here's our matzotash bag, which has the three pieces of matzah in there, right? And so now we would take the matzah, and what happens to the matzah? I take, the Father will take out the middle piece. Yes. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They take out the piece representing the Son. Now they don't know that. You tell them Jesus is in the Passover, no. They probably flip out. Uh, most of them would. Uh, if they're not believers. And, uh, and I've had Jewish people tell me there's no Jesus in the Passover. Well, if you get through tonight, I want you to tell me if there's Jesus in the Passover. Right. And what they'll do with this now, guess what they do? Break, Break it. it. Break it. It's broken for us. And he is broken. His body was bruised and broken for us. <coughs> then they take another little sack, like this. And they put this piece, and they stick it right in that little sack. Hide it. And they do what? They close that up. And the Father will take this. He will hide it somewhere away from us. And that represents what? Christ broken for us, right? 
buried, buried. Here's the other half. He was buried, right? Yeah. That's right. Taken away in the grave yeah. uh, for three days in the grave. And then we have this piece, of course, that's left here. And we're going to use that piece too. But uh, So that's what happened. Now, Jewish scholars really don't, they can't explain any of that. But that's the kind of thing that many Christian scholars, conservative Christian be believers who write about it, uh, believe may have come in through Messianic Jews, believers in the early church. And then it stayed in there all the way through because the, 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 they, they, they just became uh, permanent fixtures of the Passover. Other things, of course, came, came in later. Uh, and so it's symbolic of the unblemished Passover lamb, of course, no leaven. And then what will the Father do next? He'll take the uh, Passover Haggadah, and in here he'll read the whole story of the Passover and the deliverance from Egypt. He'll read that story. Just what I read, pretty much what I read in Exodus 12, and a lot more. Okay? So that's what he will do. And uh, the story is read, the whole story is told, and they will make much of it. You know, we should make much of Jesus. Yeah, uh, they'll make much of the story because it changed their life entirely. Yeah, yeah. And they were no longer slaves. And they, they want, Jewish people want their children to know all about that. And so, uh, so they'll make much of that story. And uh, that's what they do. And as the story unfolds, <laughs> there'll be four questions that are asked. Now, if you want to look at those questions, or where they come from, they're not exactly today what they are in the Bible, but they're related to it. And you'll find it there in Exodus chapter 12 again, in verses 26 and 27. Well, I'll show you right there. In verses 26 and 27, down there, my eyes are not too great here reading from them. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service that ye shall say? There's the sacrifice of the Lord to pass over the pass over the houses of Egypt, the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our house. That's what they were supposed to tell their children to do. And so, but there are four questions that will be asked. They're asked by the children. The children have been prompted. They've been prepared to ask these questions. And so the four questions uh, would be these. The first question will be, uh, why is this night different from all other nights? Because this is a special night, you know. And uh, why are we eating matzah instead of mom's nice hot rolls? <laughs> Things like that. You want to put it in the children's mind, you know. Uh, and the father will say, well, uh, it's because we were slaves in Egypt. And on this night, God delivered us. Amen. 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 And that's parallel to being delivered from the bondage and the slavery of sin. Right, right. And then, why do we eat unleavened bread? You know, why do we have to eat this kind of not so good bread? Well, the Bible tells us a little bit. Exodus 12, 11 says they had to leave in haste. So. Yeah. They had to do everything quickly to make this meal. They didn't have time to let bread rise, for one thing, but they were ordered not to have leaven in the bread. Deuteronomy 16.3, I won't turn there because we were lack of time, but Deuteronomy 16.3 also talks about the Passover, and Deuteronomy 16.3 gives us to uh, believe that maybe it was the poor diet they had in slavery that it was right. That because Deuteronomy calls this the bread of affliction. And so, uh, in 16.3 there. Uh, so, leaven represents sin, of course, in the scriptures many times. And, of course, the matzah also represents Christ being pierced and striped. Then that third question is, why do we eat bitter herbs? Because they're all going to taste of these bitter herbs, even if it is now. And, uh, <coughs> and so, why do we eat those? Why do I have to eat that? before the good stuff comes. Uh, well, 
Papa will say, you're going to eat this tonight, and you're going to taste it, because our lives were very bitter in Egypt. We don't want to forget that. So we want to be grateful, thankful for what the Lord has done. And so, for what God has done for us. And then they'll say, why do we relax or recline and eat at our leisure? Why do we spend five hours at the table, Papa? <laughs> you know too many kids who like to stay around the dinner table for four or five hours huh. and he'll say well because we're free That's right. and we can take our time and That's enjoy right. things yep. look at Deuteronomy 621 yes. the verses after that and uh, you'll see a little bit of that there then we get out the Haggadah again I'm not going to do this take all night. But Papa is then going to take out the Haggadah. This one has a, a, a pretty good story, but, but some of them have very long, some shorter. But he's going to tell the story of Abraham to Joshua. So that'll take a while. We're not going to do that <laughs> tonight. Uh, probably a lot of you know that. But they're going to rehearse their history. Yes. And so, sometimes we should do that. Yes. We should rehearse our history. Even if you apply it to our country, you know. Yes. We're forgetting our history, all this right. rewriting yeah. of history. Yes, That's right. Well, with the Jewish people, part of the ceremony is so they don't forget their history. That's right. And so they want their children to know. And so, after he does that, shares that story, Abraham to Joshua, then we get the second cup. Papa's going to pour the second cup, the cup of deliverance, and everybody's going to drink of the second cup. And the second cup uh, is drunk at the end of that story, and then they will read it. I'm not going to read them because it would take us too long. We're running out of time, and I want to get through everything. But they will read what are called the halal songs. Right. You know, the songs right. were the worship songs. Sang songs tonight, just like we have a hymn book. The songs were the hymn book of the Jewish people. Yeah. Right. The temple. And so <coughs> they're gonna take what are called the halal songs. There are certain songs that are related to the Passover season. That's right, amen. Psalm 113. To 118. Right. And at this point in the Passover, they're going to read Psalm 113 and 114. Right at this moment. So I'm going to let you read those at home. But uh, Psalm 113 and 114. And they're going to wash their hands again. They're always washing their hands through the whole night. So they're going to do that. And, uh, and then what? They're going to have a blessing over the matzah a special blessing before it is given to be eaten. Now, for that, they'll use this matzah. They don't get to the one that's hidden yet. So, there's going to be a blessing over the matzah. They'll thank the Lord's Hebrew prayer, special Hebrew prayer for the matzah. And all that is in the Haggadah. And uh, so they're going to pray over the matzah, and uh, there will be a special blessing, blessing given. Then, the bitter herbs are eaten. What, how are they going to eat the bitter herbs? Well, they're going to have what they call the halal sandwich. And the halal sandwich is going to be the matzah, and it's going to be the bitter herbs, and dipped in the bitter herbs, and uh, they're going to taste that. So they're going to take that, dip it in the bitter herbs, make a little sandwich of it, just a small piece. And they're going to eat that. Take that, and it's going to be hot. Yes, it is. Not so tasty. I think Earl must have bought a really strong <laughs> bitter herbs here. <laughs> and, um, now later on, <laughs> now later on, uh, came the Harris that they came up with this sweet mixture. That's not in Exodus 12, yeah. but it did come along as a representation 
of sweetness out of suffering. Yeah. So now what they do is they'll add a little of that, put that on there, and it'll eat, make, all, make it all together, and it's a sweet and bitter sandwich, so to speak. So um, that's what they will do with the halal sandwich. Now it's about that point that uh, they'll stop this part of things. And the mom and daughters and ladies and the family will bring out the big meal. And they'll have a big meal and they'll take as long as it takes to eat their big uh, Passover meal. And it will be a merry time of rejoicing. And uh, charity is a part of it. Often everybody gives something to give to poor relatives or poor people in the community. They think of other people. When you think about salvation, we should think of other people. Right. God gave us a gift. Amen. We should give it yes. to other people. That's the message of it. And then once they're finished with the meal, now the papa's going to come back, and he's going to ask one of the children, usually it's the youngest son, and I ask one of the children, I'll, I'll use one of the boys later, maybe you don't find the Elijah for me. But the, he'll bring it out. The, the child will find the matzah. And he'll be jumping up and down and bringing it. I found it, I found it, I found it. And the father will reach in his pocket and he'll give them money. He'll give them a coin to redeem. Wow. That back. Yeah. You know, remember Judas? Yeah. Yeah. Money. And yeah. so. So then the father has his back. And this here is now uh, the, the Jewish people. This is called the Afikon. Have you ever heard that? The Afikon is a Greek word. It's the only Greek word. Remember, this is a Hebrew Jewish term. But the yeah, Afikon is a Greek word. You know what Afikon means? He came. Amen. Wow. Then the Jewish uh, father is going to do what? Uh, he's going to take this out of the and he's going to break it up in pieces. Yeah. It's going to be small pieces. Yeah. And now the father will go around. It's almost like me. The father will go around and he'll give one to everybody in the family. Yeah. Right? He'll right. give one to everybody. And they will take it all together. And it's the very last thing they will eat on the eve of Passover, because all the next day will be a day of fasting. Right. Um, but when they eat that, the Jewish people, because it's the last thing they eat, they say Apicomen means dessert. Oh, Even the yeah. rabbis say that. Doesn't mean dessert. It means he came. There are scholarly articles written on the meaning of the word apicomen. Yeah. Uh, if you want one, I'll give it to you. I don't have it with me, but I have it in my office. And so, well, so nothing is eaten. Once the apicomen has been broken, passed around, now they're not going to eat anything else after that. But there's still a couple of more cups left, right? And so we have a couple of more cups to go, and they'll be graced. Following the Apicomen, they have another series of prayers <coughs> that will end the meal part entirely. And uh, uh, then as, after they have grace, then they have this third cup of wine, which is the one that's called the cup of redemption. And they'll all take the cup of redemption. Christ wore our penalty for it. Amen. So they've just taken the apple Amen. The broken body. Wow. Amen. And they will take the third cup. Now, we have we can't leave this part without looking at Luke. Luke twenty two. You can look at Matthew, Matthew twenty six, or Luke chapter twenty two, verse twenty. I usually use the Luke passage. I think it, it shares just a little bit more, but and uh, 
Luke 22. And you'll notice at the beginning in verse 1 there of Luke 22, it says, Now the feast of unleavened bread grew nigh. That's the feast that immediately follows the Passover, right? And uh, so then they get to the Last Supper. And look, the Lord was at a Passover meal when he instituted the Lord's Supper, right? Yeah. How did he do that? Well, look at Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Likewise, also the cup after he took, uh, also the cup after supper, he took the oh, part of that's what I want. So he's given them, of course, the bread, you know, with uh, this is my body which is broken for you. So that's there in Luke 22 as well. But then he says, likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Yeah. So most scholars think he was talking about this third cup, the cup yeah. of redemption. Uh, and you know, he says now, but behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined, but woe well unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So he takes the cup, and he institutes here in Luke, in Matthew as well, he institutes the Lord's Supper. And uh, so this is uh, uh, getting to the, near the end of the Passover. But this third cup will be the one that he's referring to. Now, we stop after the third cup, before the fourth cup, and we turn to Elijah. Because the Jewish people are going to wondering, uh, well, is Elijah going to show up? Where's the Messiah? Where is the Messiah? Yeah. That's wow. it. Where is and remember the book of Malachi where it says, uh, Elijah will come to me. There was John the Baptist who partially fulfilled that, certainly. But, uh, but, so they're going to fill the Elijah cup. And then, the youngest son in the family. Uh, I don't know, do we have any, any bo young boys who want to go off front for Elijah? And uh, Dr. Gardner? Go ahead, Austin. Go ahead, buddy. Come on. Want to go? <laughs> so you are going, Austin? No. Austin, um, Papa's going to say to you, Austin, go to the door and open the door, the front door of the house now we want to open, and see if Elijah's there. Right. So you go out the door and go. you see if Elijah's there. Go. And I hope you're going to come back and tell me that he's not. <laughs> 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 Dr. Gardenhouse, our founder, Dr. Gardenhouse is with the Lord now, has been for years. But he there? used to say he was the youngest son in the family. Anybody out there? Not there. How about Julius? No Elijah. No Elijah. Dr. Gardenhouse used to say every time, every year, I dreaded that moment. He'd say, I, when my father asked me to do that, he said, every year I thought, sure, I would go out and find Elijah. <laughs> But remember, they're still looking for the first coming of the Messiah. Right, that's right. They're Amen. not looking. We're looking for what? The second coming of the Lord, not the first. But they're still looking for the first coming. So they're looking for Elijah. And of course, he comes back. Austin came back and said, no, Elijah. So why? Well, Elijah's going to be the one to tell them of the coming of the Messiah. Yes, it that's was. what they believe. And uh, of course, we had John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Uh, and But you know, I always stop here and say, it's kind of a pathetic scene. Because the Messiah has already come. Right. And everything we've seen here shows us that this whole thing we've done tonight points to Jesus. Right. He's already been here yeah. and gone. And, uh, but they don't get it. They don't see that. So that's why we should be praying that when they do this ceremony, they will see somehow, someone in the family, right. maybe only one, right. will see the Lord Jesus Christ in the Passover, because unfortunately the Jewish people, 
they reject the wonderful news of what this whole thing means, what the psalm means. Finally, we come to the fourth cup, and the Father will pour the fourth cup. But remember, we're not going to eat anything else. We're on a fast now for all the next day of the Passover. The fourth cup of wine is taken. This is the cup of praise or communion. Some people believe it's the cup of the coming kingdom. It, they believe that because it's what Jesus said in the Gospels. I won't drink of this anymore. Would you remember he said that? Until I drink it anew. In, I, I'm sorry, I'm not good at memory, old age memory. I'm not sure it's quoting anymore, but, but, uh, but you know, it says, won't drink. Most people, most scholars believe that was the fourth cup. That he didn't partake of the fourth cup. And, uh, but, of course, around the Passover table, they will. And uh, so that would have been the fourth cup that Jesus said that he wasn't going to drink until he did it anew with them. Because so, and to, and to make our conclusion, uh, what we have here really showing forth is the Paschal Lamb. That's right. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what John the Baptist said in John 1, 29. The old, the Lamb of God. So we not only see Christ in the Passover, uh, but uh, we see ourselves as well, right? Uh, he's the sinless substitute for the sinner. Yeah. And uh, he's been sacrificed for us. One more verse, 1 Corinthians. Here's the connection. Paul makes it. It's interesting to me. I preached about Paul. No, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a Jew. And the fact that he writes 1 Corinthians and he understood perfectly what most Jewish people don't understand today. And he said in 1 Corinthians 7, Purge not therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened. You know, you should... You know, you should not that we should be sinless, I like to say, not that we should be sinless or can be sinless. sinless. We don't teach sinless perfection. But we can I like to say we can sin less. Right? Because we're in Christ, he allows us to have victory. Because it says, for even Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Paul made the connection. Christ is the Passover, is the ultimate Passover sacrifice. And Paul told the Corinthian church that. And uh, unfortunately, most Jewish people don't recognize. Uh, so uh, at the end, <coughs> after the fourth cup, <coughs> excuse me, the Jewish people will read the remainder of the Hallel Psalms. <coughs> Pardon me. Which will be Psalm 115 to 118. Again, we don't have time to read all those, but I will read you just a couple of verses from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is a messianic psalm. That's right. That points to Jesus. Yes, it is. The Jewish people read it every year when they're doing this Passover. I'll read just a couple of verses. Uh, it says there in verse 8, it's better, to, put, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And in verse 14, it says, The Lord is my strength in song. Listen to this. And has become my salvation. Amen. That's just what Jesus did. He became our salvation. Yes. It says, Open to me the gates of righteousness. In verse 19. Right. That's what Jesus did. Yeah. Yeah, because it's in his righteousness only that we can be righteous. Right. And then it says in verse 22, a very famous verse, the stone which the builders refused, they didn't want it, because there was people they didn't want it, has become the headstone of the corner. Right. Right. This is the Lord's doing. <coughs> it is marvelous in our eyes. Yeah. This is the day which the Lord hath made we will rejoice and be glad. And then, and then verse 26. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Praise God. It's Jesus coming. That's right. And 
we should not forget that. And of course, we have other passages, Isaiah 53 and others. But So you see, Israel, Jewish people celebrate the Passover, but there's no redemption right. in what they celebrate. Yeah. Uh, Judaism can't help them. Uh, they need the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, they have a religion, but it's a religion that can't bring salvation. No religion can bring salvation. And so Judaism is just one more religion of works. Uh, there's the bone, but there's no lamb. I mean, there is a lamb, but they don't know. And so, and the epicomen cries out, he came, the witness. He came, and so these are wonderful, wonderful symbols of Christ in the Passover. And then at the end of the Passover, Elijah hasn't come, and so they'll say, "Okay, next year." They'll say, "Next year, Jerusalem." And, uh, and amen. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, of course, when it's next year in Jerusalem, though, for we know it'll be next year or uh, whenever that time comes when Jesus is reigning, ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. Right. Mm. So, Amen. of course, they're hoping for the temple to be rebuilt. Yeah. Uh, we have Isaiah 53. <laughs> and then I always like to close. Uh, Isaiah 53 points out the, uh, the suffering Messiah. And, of course, we have the suffering Messiah in the Passover meal. And if they would only look at Isaiah 53. And then we have a New Testament witness. That's found in Luke, that same chapter of Luke, Luke 22, we just looked at. Luke 22, 37. I find a lot of people don't really, I'm uh, sure they know, know this is there. They don't really make the connection. Jesus actually said he was the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. He said it. Uh, he said it plainly and clearly to, uh, to the Jews, to his disciples. In Luke 22, 37, he says, For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And what did he quote? Isaiah 53, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's the suffering Messiah of Isaiah 53, that's right, in Luke 22, 37. And he's the only way of salvation. And uh, that's why we have a mission to preach to Jewish people, to take the message to them. Because without them, uh, pardon me, without the message, they're going to perish. They're going to be lost. And, uh, you know, and there's a big tribulation time coming. And if they don't get saved, they're going to be two thirds of Jews will perish in the tribulation if the ones that aren't saved. So pray for the Jewish people. Amen. By the way, I forget to tell you one thing that I have completely ignored it. My wife was here waiting to light these candles. <laughs> I should have had her come up here because I haven't done the Passover more than a year now. You know, the COVID thing has taken me off, right. off the line. Right? Uh, but usually the wife would come up. And she, I'll do it now, but she would come up and she would light the candles to, at the very beginning of all this. Why does she light the candles? And then the wife says uh, a Hebrew prayer. She'll, she'll put her little white uh, veil on and she'll say a Hebrew prayer. And she lights the two candles. And she prays, and this is the reason I'm telling you this because it's another reason for Jesus. She prays. That God would bring the light back from the dark. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Jesus said, well, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Right. But there's another thing. The reason the woman doesn't light the candle and says that prayer is she's viewed by the Jewish people of having brought the dark down because she was the first to concede to Satan's wiles. And she offered to her husband. He was responsible for feeling that. But, uh, but that's why they do that. Uh, so, and then bring that light back. Amen. And of course, God did bring the light back. Amen. Amen.
through the Lord Jesus Christ. Good. 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 So, uh, anybody have any quick, quick questions? Or, or we're we'll way after time. Good job. Amen. 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 Pray this week. We have a we have a mission trip going to New York City this week, Friday. They're leaving. We have 11 people going to New York to work with our missionaries. There we have two missionaries then we in New York City, and there's 11 people, some Bible college students, but we have some older <laughs> folks too who are getting in on this trip. We have four four of the people on the trip are over 60. So old folks, you can get in on these things too, you know. <laughs> uh, and they're going to New York City and they're going to pound the pavement. And, and we, our, our workers there are in the heart of 1.6 million Jews. So pray for that trip. And we also have our four-day focus coming up, if anybody's interested. We have four days of training for Jewish evangelism in June, later in June, if you're interested. We also have a magazine. You're welcome to take those out there. They're free, no charge at all. So please take as many as you like. We all, it's, it's, there's so many young people in this church. It's good to see that, by the way. We do have internships and mission trips for young people. Um, we take young people with us as directors, our global outreach director, our field directors sometimes take young people with them on their trips to the various fields, just to be with them, walk, work beside them, see what they do. And we also have an internship in Israel from one to three months where you can go to Israel. We have a ministry house there. We have three missionary families there. We have Project Nehemiah, which we help Jewish immigrants uh, who are coming into Israel. And we use it as an opportunity to share the gospel Amen. with them when we can. We can Amen. always do that, but we do try to do that. And uh, another one of our ministries is sharing Bibles with Jewish people. And I wanted to say I have some Bibles. If you know a Jewish person, if you ever think you might be able to give a Bible to them, we'd love to have you take a Bible. These are free. We don't charge anything. The Society for the Distribution of Hebrew Scriptures. Ever heard this of is them? Hebrew, yeah. Yeah, this is wow. English and Hebrew. Wow. And uh, so... We have these Bibles for them. We put them in two volumes because the Jewish people sometimes will not take the New Testament, but sometimes if they won't, we can still get them to take the Old Testament. Amen. And the Gospel is there in the Old Testament, and Isaiah 53 is there if they'll read it, uh, and things like that. So uh, pray with us uh, for these things. And uh, we have 65 missionary families around the world. We have a work in Israel. and. Uh, 20 other countries we're involved in around the world. So, thank you for your support. I don't want to forget to say that. This church, I told Pastor, maybe I should just mention, uh, I told Pastor, this church has supported the mission, our mission, since 1956. And the first time I came here, Dor Doreen knows the story, knows the lady, she can tell you the name, I forgot already. But there was a lady in the church back then, and she remembered Dr. Gartenhouse when he came here of course, it would have been over there in the other building, uh, in 1956. And the church has supported us ever since he made that visit. Wow. And so we're very grateful to you. <coughs> and uh, if we can ever do anything for you or, you know, have a, you know, uh, something for you in Jewish evangelism, if you have people you'd like to reach, if you have any connections with Jewish people, you know, one of our purposes as a mission is to teach and train local churches. You know, 65 missionary families, you're not going to reach all the Jews in the yeah, world. No. It has to be local churches right. who yeah. get a burden, like we talked about this morning, for Jewish people in their own community. Amen. And, and go out. I've had churches do that. Just had a church in Richmond, Indiana, called me, and uh, they had a bunch of Orthodox Jews move into their community, rural Indiana, uh, uh, ten or fifteen families, and they had a got burden to reach them. So they called us and said. What can we do? So we've been working with them. We're going to do a seminar for them. And we're going to try and help them to reach out to that community. Yeah, That's the thank thing you. we do. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome, my brother. I thank you also. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Dad, we're just going to go ahead and be in silence for today. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, the Bible says, that ye may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, 
has sacrificed for us. Can you say that? Can you say that Christ, who is our Passover, was sacrificed for us? Can you include yourself in that? Can you say, Christ is my Passover. Christ is my Christ. He is my Savior. Young man came to the house today, and my father and I tag teamed on him. His name was Robbie. Pray for Robbie. Robbie Hazel, 24 years old, came and wanted to ask me without the homestead, noticed how things had ordered and everything was, and he's just amazed by it. And I said, I said, you know, Robbie, I'm not interested in what you have to think about the homestead. I want to know what you think of Jesus Christ. 45 minutes later, Robbie bowed his head in tears and received Christ as his personal Savior. Amen. And in that process, I said to Robbie at one point, Robbie, Jesus Christ is such a gentleman, he'll never force you to come on down. But he wants you to make him your Christ, your Lord, your Savior. Personally, you have to make that choice. I imagine there's quite a few Christians here tonight. But tonight, if you haven't in a time and a place made the decision to have him be your Passover, would you do this simple act and say, Pastor, I'm not sure that he's mine. I am not sure that I'm going to heaven. I don't have that security. Slip your hand up if that's you. Slip your hand up if you're unsure of your salvation. It doesn't matter what your age is. If you're little and you're not sure, slip your hand up. If you're 80 and you're not sure, slip your hand up. Okay. Would you stand together with me? Those who would come and pray those who need to be baptized, those who need to be a member of this church, walk down this aisle. You know you need a church. Come on down here. Be a member of this church. You know you need to pray for the community. Come down. Pray for this community. Dear ones, this is the most important part of this service right now. What is it that needs to be changed in your life? Perhaps there's something that needs change in your life. Why don't you come? You look at the symbolism of this Passover time. I, I'm curious. I'm, I can't wait to talk to Jeff O'Day. I can't wait to talk to some who know more about this than I do and what they may have learned or, or something that may have seemed mundane to them even because of all they know. But you know what's the most beautiful thing about this thing? Is that Jesus Christ is central in every detail. Is he central in every detail of your life? What did you do yesterday that centered around Jesus Christ? What did you do this week that was all about Jesus Christ? The reason I wanted it to be just kind of quiet in here is because I really want us to contemplate for just a minute right now. Think. How is he central? How is he central? Are you spending hours with him in the morning each day? Say, oh, pastor, if I spend 10 minutes, well, is he central? Does that make him central in your day? 168 hours a week he gives you. What do you do with it? Believer, repeat after me. If you really want to do this, just repeat after me in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I don't want you to be central. I don't know if you're the center of all I am. I've accepted you. I know you're in my heart. I know you're my God. But oh Lord, as John mentioned, I can't be sinlessly perfect. But I certainly can by your grace and through your power. Sin less. Make it so, Father, I pray. In Jesus' name. Have a great night, everybody. We love you. Um, everyone can come and have a taste or look over the table.